Good morning, Faith Fellowship, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching live online, and anyone who may tune in later. Um, God's peace to you. My daughter Abby this morning prayed for me. She said, Dear Jesus, please help my daddy to speak your words and to love you. I don't know how much more you can ask than that. So I'm going to pray for us as we get started. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come before you on this beautiful and glorious day, uh, Sabbath day that you have created to be holy time and to be an opportunity for us to unplug from the world, from the stresses of life, from the responsibilities of life, from the chaos that is constantly bombarding us, um, the, the pull of the world and from from the nature of sin and and to help us to focus on you, to be encouraged by one another, to be focused on spiritual things, things that are eternal, and to be recharged and refueled for another week of, of living for you in this lost and dying world. I pray that this morning as I share the the message that you've given me, the words that you've put on my heart, the experiences that you have uh, blessed me with and taken me through, that you would use my words to to be a blessing and and an inspiration and an encouragement to my brothers and sisters who would hear it, Um, and that most of all, Lord, that we would be changed each and every day to be more like your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. When I was 15 years old, my parents bought me my first guitar. It was a box set, a little lion made by Washburn, and I had, you know, the whole kit with it. We were in Florida for Christmas. Um, I remember because I decided to start trying to learn that guitar on the drive back from Florida. God bless my father and mother and brother for enduring many hours of, um, of yeah, very interesting. But um, since then, I've almost never really been without a guitar and just like taking one everywhere I go. I was, I was at uh, Ruth's wedding just recently and, um, and the, it's like the band hadn't been there yet and, um, and Javier, the sound guy, was like kind of worried and he said, Chris, you have your guitar, right? I'm like, yep, I do. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I've been almost never without it, but... Um, A day came where um, Lex and I had uh, quite a bit of medical debt, and I needed to, uh, well, I wanted to try to get out from underneath of that, so I started the process of selling, like, all my guitars. I put every single one of them up for sale, and I ended up not having one. Um, About a year passed, and I decided I wanted to to buy another one, and a a nice one of higher quality, and so I went and and I bought it, even though... uh, probably shouldn't have, couldn't really afford it, <laughs> and um, it was a beautiful Taylor 914 CE, and um, I really, really liked it, um, but on the 45th day of the 45-day return policy, I took it back and returned it, because it was just it was just too much, too extravagant, couldn't afford it. I really couldn't justify that expense. So I continued to play a guitar that was on loan to me from work for about another year. I uh, still didn't have one. And, I, and honestly, I slowly just kind of became less and less concerned with it. And um, so I really didn't think about it at all. And one day a few weeks ago, my boss, Matt, uh, walks into my office and he says, um, an anonymous donor just came in with a donation for you to buy a guitar. Um, not knowing the situation. Even Matt wasn't really familiar with, with everything that had happened. And so, honestly, I, I was like, okay, well, it was, a, it was a large donation. And I was like, ah, try to convince him. I told Matt because he wouldn't, he, you know, tell me who this anonymous donor was. And so I tried to convince him to get them to let us use the money for something else, you know, something more, more needed or whatever. And they were, um, I guess just stubbornly adamant that this money was to be used only for this. And so um, when I went to look for a guitar to buy, you wouldn't believe, but the money that they gave me was the exact amount that I needed to replace the guitar that I had returned 
um, a while before. Now, the most mind-blowing thing about this is that I didn't, I didn't even, like, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't realize, you know, that God had, uh, had basically given me this gift, this encouragement to replace this guitar that I had wanted, but that I had to, taken back. And um, it wasn't until um, I was sharing this story with a, another musician, my friend Blaze, that he told me, when I told him this whole story, it was kind of coming together as I was telling it. And, um, and he said, wow, Chris, look at God's faithfulness. That's what he said to me. Look at, first thing, look at God's faithfulness. To take something that you thought you really needed, you know, and to teach you this lesson along the way that you don't really need what you think you need. And then at the end of the lesson, to give you such an extravagant thing to replace, you know, even better than what you had lost in the first place. And this, this may seem insignificant in the scope of the world, right? And it's like, oh great, so you got a free guitar. That's real nice, bro. <laughs> For me, it's very significant, very significant, because every time I play that instrument, I am reminded of God's faithfulness in my life, okay? And that's what the message is about today. Um, God said to me in that moment, he said, I'm present, I'm with you, I'm always with you, I'm teaching you lessons, I'm guiding you, and I'm faithful to be a good father and to give good gifts. And the gifts that I receive, I may not always consider to be a good gift, like a guitar or anything, anything like that, but the good gifts that God is faithful to give are way better than physical things. They're fruits of the Spirit and how he manifests within us the character of Christ, of righteousness. Incredible gifts. So I learned these three things, and I want, if if you'd like to write them down or whatever you can, but this is what I'm going to share with you mainly throughout the course of the message this morning. Three things. Number one, God is faithful to seek us in our need. God is faithful to seek us in our need. Number two, God is faithful to confront us in our sin. He's faithful to confront us in our sin. And number three, God is faithful to reconcile us to his family. So number one, God's faithful to seek us in our need. Number two, God is faithful to confront us in our sin. And number three, God is faithful to reconcile us to his family. Now the question is this morning, what are we in need of? Is I really in need of a guitar? Are we really in need of the things that that we think that we need? Our real need is really only one, surprisingly. And that is, in my opinion, it's a changed heart. It's for the Holy Spirit to give us a changed heart. With that, we we have everything. We have everything. The second question is, what is the sin that God is trying to confront in our lives. God's faithful to seek us in our need and we need a changed heart. God is faithful to confront our sin. What sin is he trying to confront for us? Because we are shameful, wicked, wretched people that are worse than dirt, as I always say, because at least dirt is not sinful and blaspheming the name of God by living against his commands and claiming to live under his name and his inheritance. So we are horrible. But praise God for his gracious gift of Jesus Christ, which reconciles us back to God. What sin is he trying to confront in our lives? Because if we don't see any, we're in trouble. If if we refuse to see or to accept the confrontation that he's trying to bring us, then we're in trouble. Um, These three lessons can really be seen from the beginning of human history to the very end of the whole biblical narrative and every pivotal point in between. I started recognizing this as I, as I was learning this lesson. And this morning I would like to discuss just that. So if you'll open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3, we're going to start in the beginning of the story. Genesis chapter 3. Um, and I kind of set the context as you're turning there, Genesis chapter 3. Um, God has just created the earth. Everything is beautiful. Everything is good, except for the woman. She's very good. (laughs) Really, check it out. Um, 
Everything is awesome. God has created this perfect world, this perfect, beautiful place for us to live. And um, we come to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden? Uh, The old devil always planting a seed of doubt. Of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. I was wondering where she came up with that. God originally gave the command to Adam, so probably in his reiterating it to her, he's like, God said don't eat it and don't touch it. (laughs) You know, like just a little extra protection. Um, Verse 4, you won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. Now verse 7, so so now all of a sudden the stage has been set. They have fallen. Uh, Things are not, they're not good. They violated God's command and and the wages of sin is death. So we have, a, we have a big problem here. And in uh, verse 7, we start to see how God is faithful to seek us in our need. Right? Point number one. Verse 7, At that moment their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. They didn't even realize what their real need was. You know, the... They had a physical need that they tried to cover themselves, and and God, um, He was going to help them with that, but they had a spiritual need. All of a sudden, they're in need of a sacrifice, and death has never happened, you know, in the garden before. They don't even know what that's about. They were probably just shocked when God killed the first animal as a sacrifice for their sins and to clothe them. So um, God sought them out. Immediately he comes to seek them in their need. He is faithful. Um, Verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Classic. Then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? The, 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 the serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Well, it doesn't say the that many times, but it's a blame game. You know, they're playing the blame, the blame game. So um, God is confronting their sin. He doesn't just let it go under the rug or just slide forever. Right now in the world, you know, we think, eh, sometimes sin doesn't seem like that big a deal because God just lets bad things happen and he doesn't seem to be very present since Jesus, you know, was taken up into heaven. There's horrible things that happen. You know, we get away with little things in our lives. No big deal. God is faithful to confront our sin. He was faithful then. He's faithful now. And he will bring it to our attention if we're willing to be confronted. Verse 14, Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed. More than all animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And here comes... Number three, God is faithful to reconcile us to his family. I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This is the first place in the Bible that we see the promise of the Messiah. And it's kind of subliminal. You kind of have to, to think about it to see what it's saying. But he's, he's saying, I'm going to cause enmity between your offspring and the woman so there's going to between god's people and lucifer there is going to be a battle there's going to be there's going to be a tension and going further than that when he says he so a very specific person of the woman's offspring he will strike your head and you will bruise his heel okay so the serpent is going to bruise satan is going to bruise jesus christ's heel uh uh um 
not permanent, uh, momentary, a temporal um, bruise. He's going to, to crush Christ on the cross. He's going to enact the, the whole um, situation that led up to Christ's death, stirring up hatred in the hearts of the people and jealousy in the Pharisees, stirring, orchestrating those events. And ultimately, God the Father was the one who took Jesus' life. But it's only a temporal wound because three days later, Jesus rose up from the grave and gives us eternal life in doing the same. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Um, really, really awesome. But he, in doing so, crushes the serpent completely. He, he tears away the power of, of death in the grave from Lucifer and, and wins the victory, ultimately. At that, that was the moment where the game was really over. The mission was accomplished, and now we're awaiting the fulfillment of the promises of God, right? God is faithful to reconcile us to his family. Later down the road, um, in the days just before Jesus came, the religious people were looking for him, yet they missed him. And the people who were non-religious weren't really looking, but they found him. Is that odd? It's like, how can this be? Today, his return is imminent, and the situation is the same, maybe worse. Many Christians are looking for God to come back, but are going to miss him entirely. It's because they're looking for a God that does not exist. There's, there's two masters that we can serve, right? There's God. We can be slaves to Christ or we can be slaves to sin. The Christian church as a whole um, perhaps believes that we can serve a third master. This God doesn't exist. It's the God that, that is basically like a Santa Claus. It comes you know, once a year whenever we really need him to, gives us a lot of good stuff that we are asking for, and then you know, we put him on the shelf and tell them to basically be quiet and don't bother us until we come back with another need later. That God doesn't exist. We are, we're not the masters. We're the slaves, either to Christ, who has our best interest at heart, which is not necessarily to give us what we want, because a lot of times if we were given what we want, it would destroy us. It would consume us completely. He gives us what we need. Praise God. The other master will take everything that we have from us and destroy us. Slavery to sin. Other people are not even looking for Christ to return and are going to find everything that they've ever needed. How can this be? I'm asking myself this question. In the days of Christ, we're approaching Christmas time now, and in the days of Christ, his church, if you will, Israel, his people, knew that he was coming, knew the prophecies. They're talking about it. The Messiah is coming, Look, looking for the Messiah. And when Jesus came, they didn't recognize him because he wasn't the God that they were looking for. That's God's people, not the pagans, God's people. And the end times say the same thing. The book of Matthew talks about it. Um, I believe in the books of Timothy, Thessalonians, they talk about the same thing, a great falling away from the faith that people are going to miss Christ's second coming, not because they slept through it or something like that, but because the Jesus that's coming back is not the Jesus that they think they serve now. God gives us everything, but he also requires everything. We can't, we can't receive something when our hands are already full, full of religion, full of our own desires. Christ wants to give us everything, but we have to let go. So I realize that the reason this happens is because of these same three principles. Number one, God is faithful to seek us in our need. Our need is a changed heart for the Holy Spirit to change our heart. We all have that same need. Number two, God is faithful to confront us in our sin. You know that feeling, the conviction, um, the, the conscience, that, the nagging of that still small voice, you know? In, the, in Isaiah, 
It's um, really beautiful. Or is it Isaiah? Maybe. Oh, it's Kings when he comes to Elijah. And um, Elijah's in the cave and, and you know, the, the thunder and the fire and the earthquake and the wind and everything. And, and then the still small voice. And it's very beautiful, right? Well, sometimes that still small voice is a little less beautiful in our perspective and a little more of like a nagging. <laughs> it's like, ugh. Why do I have to, like, okay, don't, don't, don't say anything because if I don't hear it, then I'm not accountable to it, right? But that, it is a beautiful thing, nonetheless, that God persists in his faithfulness to confront us with our sin. But here's the thing, God is willing to confront us in our sin, but he's not willing to force us to turn from it. He will enable us, he will give us everything we need, the strength that we need to turn from it, but he will not force us to turn from it. In the time of Christ, God confronted both the righteous and the wicked. I say righteous kind of tongue-in-cheek because it's more self-righteous. The Pharisees, the priests, God's people, they know the law, everything. He confronts them with their sin. You brood of vipers, you know, you, you love your own traditions more than the laws of God. You don't even recognize the Messiah, all of the things that Jesus said to them. And then on the other side, he also confronted those who were, who were non-religious, you could say the, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, those who lived in openly in sin. And Jesus said to them, you know, where are your accusers? Nowhere. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. He confronted everyone's sin. But more often than not, it was the non-religious who openly accepted Christ's authority. And it was the religious who denied it completely. That should be a warning to us who have God's word, who walk with the Spirit, not to deny Christ's authority, not to cheapen his grace, that we should keep on sinning so that grace may abound. The great tribulation is coming upon this world, and it will be no different than in the time of of, uh, Jesus And the time now, only everything is going to be amplified just a million times because God is is in the business of carterizing sin. And the tribulation is about judgment. And he has a problem on his hands of having to judge people that are still living. What if tomorrow they decided to change their mind and follow Christ? But then the day before, you know, he already judged them. It's a problem. And so God has a process to take care of that. He doesn't leave loose ends. He doesn't leave the the I's undotted and the T's uncrossed. He takes care of everything. There's no loopholes. The the problem of sin will be ended forever. And he will be gracious and faithful to every single person that has a decision to make. That's what the tribulation is about. And in that tribulation, he will be confronting each of us with our own sin and with the reality of the question of which master we're going to serve. He's really going to simplify it for us which is awesome. He'll really break it down. Two different masters, very obvious. Lucifer, who perpetrates lawlessness and iniquity, will be able to see what he looks like very clearly. I'm not talking physically, but spiritually. And we will be able to see through the 144,000 the very image of Christ. People sealed with no more sin nature as God's prophets to complete the final work of taking the gospel out to the entire earth, to the ends of the earth. We'll be able to see it, and the question is, will we choose to submit to Christ's authority or not? And the third point, God is faithful to reconcile us to his family. Don't you know that when the sixth seal breaks, and the clouds part, and the skies just rip open in a glorious and majestic display of love and power and justice and hope that those who belong to Christ and have accepted the the confrontation of their sin will enter into this never-ending time of glory and righteousness of God, where the curse of sin will finally be taken away and we will be forever reconciled to the family of God. That is a glorious day. That is the reconciliation of God's people into his family. The curse of sin taken away from us because we can't extract it from ourselves. And the promises of God finally fulfilled. If that does not stir up 
hope within you and joy within you this morning, then you need to reevaluate what it is that you value in this life. Because I don't want to live for this world. I don't want to be a citizen here. I don't want to put my stock in what this world has to offer and what I can accomplish with my life. is nothing. In a lifetime, what do we accomplish that is worth taking into the realms of eternity? It is all about Christ and what He has done for us and the people that He wants to change us into. And are we going to allow Him to have his way within us, or are we going to try to abuse his grace as if we could really do that and to remain unchanged, to remain in the, in the process of just living for ourselves, only caring about ourselves and what we want to do? Are we going to sacrifice our lives, our agendas, our will to him? God is faithful to the end. He will reconcile us into his family if we are willing to allow him to confront us with sin. It's December, and it's the special month where we look at and remember the incredible display of love and humility that Christ made as the visible image of the invisible God to take the form of a human being. And the little baby... Emmanuel, God incarnate, the creator of all things, taking on human flesh in the little town of Bethlehem. And we usually start it with the words, you know, in those days, um, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken, you know, all of these words. But really it started before that. God's faithfulness in the Christmas story started before that. It started even back with the lineage of, of Christ, And I wanted to touch on that this morning as the last point. I wanted to look at a few genealogies. And so you're like, oh, no, genealogies. This is so boring. It's interesting. I used to find genealogies, numbers, all of those things boring. And I know Sandy doesn't. So, you know, I guess unless you're Sandy, you know, you don't. She may not think they're boring. <laughs> But uh, I picked out a few things for us to consider. You know, first of all, genealogies give us a very precise look into the time frames of Scripture. It nails down chronology, you know. Adam was 130 years old when he begot Terah, and then Terah was X number of years. You can count all the years and see how much biblical time there is. That's how we know that we're close to the 6,000-year mark which as we believe in this church is the 6,000 years that God is allotting for sin. And just like Israel went into Babylonian captivity for 70 years because they violated 70 Sabbath years, and God would have those Sabbath years and his perfection and justice would have them be observed. And this earth has refused to observe God, the holiness of God's Sabbath because of the curse of sin we're not able to. Any Sabbath that we try to observe is profaned by our very own minds, if nothing else. So he will have the millennial year reign in Revelation, that Revelation talks about, a thousand years where the earth will just be free from sin, will be able to receive its rest before he recreates it. How beautiful is that? So anyways, the genealogies give us a look into all of this. Not only that, but it also gives us a look into God's faithfulness, which is exactly what I wanted to talk about this morning. So I've picked a few things out for us to consider. Um, You don't necessarily have to turn here, but you can if you want uh, to Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. These are the two different genealogies of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3. Now, oddly enough, the one the person listed right above Jesus in the genealogy of both of these is Joseph. But the genealogies are different. How can Joseph, one man, have two different family trees, completely different? You know, how is that possible? Um, I don't have time to talk about that today. I'm sure Sandy would love to talk to you about it if you talk to her. But uh, you can find me later if you want to chat about it. To to simplify it, um, Matthew 1 is, is Joseph's lineage. And Luke 3 is actually Mary's lineage. Um, but for, because of the way that the Jewish culture worked and, and there was no, um, no man for the lineage to be traced through her family, then Joseph, um, kind of vicariously, they trace Mary's lineage through Joseph, but it's still her lineage. But it lists her father 
as Joseph's father. You see what I'm saying? So they just replace the name Mary with Joseph because there's no women in the lineage. So anyways, you can check that out later if you want to. Um, But this is holy, sacred, precious line of Jesus Christ, the line of of the Messiah talked about in prophecies. It's a special, sacred thing. And it is incredibly important to God and to the Jewish culture that he established. Now let me point out a few names in this list. Solomon, born from a murderous, adulterous union between David and Bathsheba. Ahaz, a horribly wicked king who propagated idolatry in God's people and sacrificed his own son to the pagan god Moloch. Manasseh, in my opinion, the worst king in Jewish history. That's arguable, but a lot of, a lot of scholars would share that opinion. Certainly one of the worst. 55 years he reigned. Horrible, horrible reign massacring people, sacrifice his own children in the fire. Um, His son, his wife actually saved, his second son, his wife actually saved from the fires. He tried to sacrifice another one. Um, Horrible. He actually had a good end to his story, but 55 years, he just tormented God's people. People like the deceiver Jacob, right? Judah, the adulterer, the list goes on and on and on. And we get to one of my personal favorites, Ruth. And you're like, oh, but Ruth was so good and it's such a beautiful romantic story and she was so sweet, so godly, a a, a vessel that the Holy Spirit worked through and all of that is true, absolutely. Awesome story, love Ruth. But Ruth chapter one verse four says that she was a Moabite, a Moabite. So please turn with me to Genesis chapter 19 and anytime someone says to turn to Genesis chapter 19, you should either brace yourself or run because Genesis 19 is a rough chapter. Uh, The first two-thirds of it is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the last third we are going to read and you'll see why. Genesis chapter 19, we're going to start in verse 30. Genesis 19, verse 30. Um, So Lot... And his family has just left Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, His wife turned back to look because her heart was still in Sodom. She was probably a a large um, portion of the reason why they were there in the first place. As you guys know, men are not swayed by their wives, right? You guys all know they're not. You know, I, I think he was probably very swayed by her to move towards Sodom. We see that at least... Although Lot seemed to kind of struggle because he was living there and he began to be twisted and tainted by the pull of sin in those cities, he didn't turn and look back. You know, it didn't seem that his heart was there. It seems like he still loved the Lord, and Second Peter talks about that. Um, but his wife, on the other hand, she turned and, and looked back because she had a hard time leaving it. So she's turned into a pillar of salt and is gone. So with their recently deceased mother... Lot and his two daughters are moving forward, and we come to verse 30. Afterward, Lot left Zoar because he was afraid of the people there, and he went to live in a cave in the mountains with his two daughters. One day, the older daughter said to her sister, There are no men left anywhere in this entire area, so we can't get married like everyone else, and our father will soon be too old to have children. Come, let's get him drunk with wine. Then we will have intercourse with him. That way, we will preserve our family line through our father. So that night, they got him drunk with wine, and the older daughter went in and had intercourse with her father, and he was unaware of her lying down or getting up again. He was plastered. Verse 34, the next morning, the older daughter said to her younger sister, I had intercourse with our father last night. Let's get him drunk with wine again tonight, and you go in and have intercourse with him. That way, we will preserve our family line through our father. So that night, they got him drunk with wine again, and the younger daughter went in and had intercourse with him. And as before, he was unaware of her lying down or getting up. Very drunk. Verse 36, as a result, both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their own father. When the older daughter gave birth to a son, she named him Moab, which means from a father. He became the ancestor of the nation known as the Moabites. Is that baffling to you? Ruth, a Moabite, 
part of the line of Jesus Christ. An incestuous relationship amongst thieves, adulterers, idolaters, murderers, blasphemers, not just wicked people, legends of wickedness, like the wickedest people, the people of, of the, the stories, the worst stories of, of Jewish history, these men and women in the line of Jesus Christ. How can that be? And that combined with the, the very humility of Christ's birth in the first place. I mean, God to take on the frailty of human flesh, susceptible to disease, persecution, death, to be born where there was no welcome party, you know? Mary and Joseph were told by angels that he was coming. The shepherds were told by angels that he was coming. So it's not like they get a, fr- a freebie, like they just found it, you know. And the wise men came later, probably about two years later, even though they're in all the nativities. So everyone who was there was told, especially by God, and they were all very humble people. The shepherds, outcasts of society, Mary, Mary and Joseph, very poor, nothing special about them. This is how Christ chose to come. This is how God chose to, to welcome himself into the world. Uh, the most humble display in all of history. When he deserved the most glorious, like the whole world should have been there, a massive party, just worship and music and everything, a celebration. There's n- none of that. Born in a feeding trough. You know, it's a silent night and everything. Well, anyone who's been, you know, around somebody giving birth knows that it's not quiet. Anybody been where there are animals living knows that it does not smell good. You know, the manger was probably not, you know, nice, the straw all nice and comfy. You know, it's not, there were no maid servants there. There was, there was, probably they didn't have much food or water or temperature regulation. You know, it's just, This was not a pleasant, comfortable place. It was just all that was there, where animals were fed and excremented. Nothing. The point that I'm trying to say this morning, the point that I'm trying to make by talking about that lineage, is that, once again, God is faithful. Do you see the pattern? God is faithful in the beginning He's faithful to us now. That's why I told you the story about the guitar. He's faithful in the end. He is faithful. He's faithful to to seek us in our need. He's faithful to confront us in our sin. And he's faithful, if we will allow him to, to reconcile us into the family of God. We can rest assured this morning in God's faithfulness. Amen? He's faithful in our lives to show us the fullest, most perfect example of love through humility, a kind of humility that is only matched in its antithesis by our own pride and arrogance. It took that kind of humility to kind of (laughs) negate the amount of, of wickedness and pride on our side. He's faithful to seek us in the midst of that arrogance and to confront us with the reality of our totally hopeless depravity. But he doesn't just leave us there like we rightfully deserve. He is then faithful to offer us reconciliation to the family of God in a way that is better than it ever could have been before. Only God is faithful to do that. To free us from the curse of sin. And so cool, to complete the work of sanctification that he is manifesting in the life of every person who is willing to submit to his authority. He's working in my life, he's working in your life and the life of every believer to make us more like Christ. And he is faithful to complete that work, to end the problem of sin, to relieve us of the carnal nature forever. God is faithful from the very beginning to the very end and that is the root of redemption, the gospel itself. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and who will bring you into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him alone who is our God and our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
all power, majesty, glory, and authority to him from before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen.